So after we looked at how endocrine system or hormones or chemical substances information system or communication system is, is um, controlled from hypothalamus down through anterior pituitary down to other glands below, we saw there are four main axes. We mainly look at hypothalamic, adrenal, uh, sorry, anterior pituitary growth hormone and the effect of growth hormone on the liver, muscle, and generally use of energy or potentiating actions of insulin. That was one axis, the growth hormone axis. The second axis we looked at was the thyroid axis. That was hypothalamo hypophysio thyroid axis, where the final product is T3, is thyro, is thyroid hormone T3, which is the one that has receptors in tissues that target cells and mainly raises, uh, in, uh, increases body metabolism, this or body metabolism in all the cells. And so we found again, it's very important to work. It facilitates growth hormone action. It facilitates insulin action or has insulin-like activity. And it is very important in the balance of use of ATP in the body. That was the thyroid axis. And today we are going to look at the cortisol axis, that is the adrenal cortex axis, which is hypothalamo, hypophysio, anterior pituitary adrenocortical axis, so that we find how uh, steroids and especially cortisol and related glucocorticoids and other steroids are regulated by ACTH from anterior pituitary adrenocortical dropping common, and ACTH itself is regulated by TRH, uh, by, um, by CRH, corticotropin release hormone from the hypothalamus. And this specifically, this axis of CRH, ACTH, generally acts on zona fasciculata and zona reticularis in the adrenal cortex. It does not have direct action in zona glomerulosa, which is where aldosterone is uh, produced. And these are the cells that regulate uh, the functions that are important when we are talking about um, when we are talking about regulation of uh, water, volume, uh, water regulation, volume regulation by vasopressin as, uh, through the, the kidneys. That is um, when we look at the adrenocortical effects on blood volume, blood flow, and uh, water reabsorb or water loss in the kidney. So that when we look at adrenal cortex, we will look at the different regulation where adrenal, where the major part of the adrenal cortex is the zona fasciculata, and this, and this is under the control of ACTH. And so it is cortisol, the final product that gives a negative feedback back at the pituitary and at the hypothalamus. It is cortisol that specifically inhibits further production of um, ACTH by anterior pituitary. As we shall see, unlike when we look at thyroid uh, release and gonadotropin release, we find that for adrenocortical function, the release starts primarily from hypothalamic regulation. It starts from uh, CRH, which regulates ACTH, and then cortisol follows. 
So it is like a positive uh, feedback mechanism. It is where CRH rises first and it causes um, ACTH to rise and that causes cortisol to rise. And it is only afterwards that the cortisol in circulation gives a negative feedback inhibition of ACTH production. So we shall look at uh, this axis as driving forward from hypothalamus. And that is where we will find the diurnal rhythm is so important. The circadian rhythm is so important that most of the cortisol is produced towards morning because that is when the hypothalamic stimulation of anterior pituitary increases. It gives a diurnal rhythm. It gives uh, a circadian rhythm or circus rhythm cycle where you have maximum production or you have high CRH towards morning, high ACTH in the, towards morning, and arise in adrenocortical function until cortisol inhibits this. We shall see this is quite difficult, uh, quite different from when we talk about uh, follicle stimulating hormone inhibiting gonadotropin release hormone. Basically, there's very little gonadotropin release hormone a lot of time. There's very little estrogen in circulation, but whenever estrogen goes up, it switches off, it inhibits FSH. So in that case, it's very important. Just like T3 is much more an inhibitor when it rises, it reduces TRH, thyroid, uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone. So I want you to see the difference between the two patterns of secretion and we'll look at them. So that is what we want to discuss today especially the synthesis and release of adrenocortical hormones, especially like glucocorticoids exemplified by cortisol, and we see the actions of cortisol in the body. But before you do that, you have to recap your anatomy or an histology of adrenal glands. I'm sure you've done that in the anatomy class. And you can remember you have a right and a left adrenal gland and it is important about these two glands, the right and left, it is important to see that they don't look the same. So even after you have removed them from the body, if somebody gives you two adrenal glands, you can identify which is the right and which is the left. And what you actually find, even their blood supply is different. On the right side, you have an you have a real uh, adrenergic artery, which is a branch from the renal artery. So you have a renal and then adrenal artery, and you have a vein that is adrenal vein coming up into renal vein. So if you want to collect blood from that side, it is easy to identify this vein and collect blood from it as adrenal vein. When you look at the left side, you find that the supply of uh, arterial blood is not from an adrenal artery from the renal artery. It is directly from uh, the uh, from the abdominal aorta, from aorta going down. The venous drainage is into inferior vena cava so that here the origin of the artery and the drainage of the vein is different. And that is important, especially when you are collecting blood from the adrenal glands. As you can see, they are on the pole of the kidneys covered by the perirenal fat, so that you separate the uh, perirenal fat and under there you find the two adrenals. If you look at the one on the, the, the right adrenal, the one on the right side, it is much more triangular. It is much of a triangle. Whereas the one on, um, on the left side, 
is like a cone, is rounded and like cone. So that you can even remember the right adreno looks more like a samusa, the left adreno looks more like a scone. So you can actually tell the difference even when they are outside. However, they are about the same size, about 10 grams each. And that means the total is about 20 grams. This is very interesting because if you have adrenals at 20 grams in a man of 70 kilograms, and you compare this, this size of adrenals with the fetal adrenal, fetal adrenal is 10 grams. In a fetus, we is like three kilograms. So you can see there, the adreno is a large percentage, about 1% of the weight of the fetus. And yet in an adult, the adreno is less than 0.001% of the mass of the adult. So we shall later be asking you to recognize the presence of fetal adreno. Fetal adreno is a very large adreno, it's very important. And when we come to talk even about labor, we'll be talking about the size of fetal adreno and its production of cortisol, fetal cortisol, which is one of the triggers of labor. The fetal adreno is very important. It's large proportionately and it plays, plays a very important role. You must also remember that uh, when we talk about a fetal adreno, we'll actually find it has some specific enzymes that maternal adreno doesn't have, and that is a, hydro, a, hydro, a 16 hydroxylase of, of uh, progesterone, of um, hydroxyprogesterone. And this 16 hydroxylase helps the mother to make estriol so that you can actually trace urinary estriol in a pregnant mother. And the origin of this is because the fetus is able to make 16 uh, DHEA, which is converted to estriol. The ordinary mother who's not pregnant will not have estriol in her urine. She doesn't have much estriol in circulation, not like uh, one who has a fetus inside. So that uh, tells you that the fetal adrenal is very important. It's very large, it's very significant. And the circulating cortisol or circulating adrenocortical steroids are very important in the fetus. They contribute highly. This is to remind you that when we talk about embryo and fetus, the earliest hormones, the earliest chemical messengers that have action in the fetus or that have receptors in the fetus are thyroxine, the T3 we talked about, and the steroids, especially glucocorticoids. These are the ones, these are the hormones that are active in uh, embryo and early fetus. Other hormones like parathormone and insulin and uh, estrogen and all the others, they usually do not have receptors at the early stage and they may not be active. They may not cause changes in the fetus. Whereas steroids and thyroxine cause changes in the fetus. Even when we come to talk about uh, pathophysiology of endocrine system, we'll find that a fetus who has excess production of steroids, especially uh, production of the DHEA or of uh, dehydro epiandrosterone, or a fetus who produces too much androsterone because is not producing cortisol, so all the steroids is turned into androgens. This baby can have hydrogen, uh, androgenization or masculinization, especially if she's a girl. And that is the basis of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So you get hyperplasia of the adrenal gland because there is very little cortisol. So there's a lot of ACTH in circulation and ACTH 
is tropic the adrenal gland the adrenal gland grows big and that is what we call congenital adrenal aplasia in the same way we talked about thyroxine if you have excess t3 in the fetus uh, it is possible to have uh, complications of hyperthyroidism if there is not enough thyroxine it is possible to have effects of uh, thyroxine deficiency especially in growth so that you get a dwarfism uh, syndrome of dwarfism due to iron due to uh, uh, iodine deficiency or thyroid deficiency and this type of dwarfism due to thyroid deficiency is called cretinism. It will come with its own features when you look up the difference between cretinism and the usual dwarfism due to growth hormone insufficiency. So that is the importance of uh, adrenal cortex. That's the importance of steroids in that the steroids have got receptors in almost all cells of the body. And so when we have hyper uh, production or when we have excess production of cortisol or other adrenocortical steroids, we'll have pathology in the body and especially pathology of high glucose in circulation, high uh, insulin, um, high glucose in circulation uh, because these are glucocorticoids. We shall also have the differences in growth or effects in growth because we have a lot of uh, adrenocortical receptors at the growing ends of bones or growing centers of bone. So bear in mind the role of adrenal cortex in production of cortisol. And remember, it also produces a lot of androgens and is one of the main producers, is the main producer of steroids, even sex steroids, even in presence of gonads. For puberty, we find a lot of the sex steroids, that is estrogen, androgens, and progesterone are produced by the adrenal cord. We'll be referring to them as adrenal steroids or adrenal sex hormones, like adrenal androgens, so that we have adrenal androgens and we have gonadal androgens, and we'll come to that. So that is adrenal glands. Total is about 20 grams, and they sit on the kidney. So if you have abnormalities of development of kidneys, like renoagenesis or renodisgenesis, you will also up, uh, automatically have a deficiency of the adrenal glands. You'll have a poor development of adrenal glands. And therefore, renoagenesis in the embryo and fetus also leads to deficiency of adrenal activity. And as we shall see, that can also affect gestation, which means that uh, the mature fetus, the fetus who's already 40 weeks or 42, may not be producing enough cortisol and could not excite his own or her own labor. So they continue to stay in the uterus, they get post because they, they have opposed gestation because they do not have enough adrenal cortical secretions. They do not have enough cortisol. And that is why renoagenesis will also be associated with insufficiency of adrenal activity. So, so much about those proportions of adrenal glands to the body. Now we need to look at the adrenal gland itself. What are the parts of adrenal gland? How is it divided? As you can see there, 
that is a section of the adrenal gland and it surrounds a ganglion inside this gland and the ganglion is adrenal medulla, what is in blue there. So in the center of adrenal gland is adrenal medulla, which produces catecholamines, just like any other ganglion in the body. If you remember ganglia of the sympathetic chain, they produce noradrenaline and adrenaline from tyrosine or phenylalanine. And even in the adrenal medulla, that's what they produce, they produce catecholamines. So we are talking about the same enzyme system, the same enzyme system of changing tyrosine into uh, catecholamines, into adrenaline and noradrenaline. They do methylation or methyl transferases and go through the synthesis of catecholamines as we shall see. That is adrenal medulla in the middle of adrenal cortex. So adrenal cortex is the outer part of adrenal gland. It surrounds the adrenal medulla. Now, when you look at the cortex itself in the next section there, it is divided into three zones, into three, um, into three segments. If you consider the inner segment, the middle and the outer segment, the largest part of adrenal cortex is the zona uh, fasciculata. Zona fasciculata meaning that it is uh, like uh, it is like a network of fibers when you cut it, and that is the zona fasciculata. And zona fasciculata actually accounts for about 70% of the whole gland, the whole adrenal cord. And because zona fasciculata is where cortisol is mainly produced, it means that adrenal cortex function is mainly production of adrenal cortisol. And so we shall look at cortisol synthesis as one of the main synthesis of adrenal cortex, one of the main releases of adrenal cortex, and when adrenal cortex enlarges, it should produce a lot of cortisol. But some of the reasons why it enlarges is because of high ACTA, because we have not enough cortisol. So again, if you have deficiency of cortisol, you'll have hyperplasia of the gland because of too much ACTA. And when that happens, because all these steroids, their precursor is cholesterol, so the cholesterol that is now there, instead of being turned to cortisol, it will be turned to androgens. So when you get hyperplasia of adrenal cord, many times it's because there is high ACTH because of low cortisol, and you end up getting excess androgens or what is called androgenization of the embryo or the fetus. Embryonized, um, sorry, mas uh, masculinization. If this is a female fetus, you get masculinization. That means instead of uh, organs, especially external genitalia, being molded like female organs, they do get exaggerated and look like male organs. For example, clitoris. Uh, clitorimegaly, you get enlargement of the clitoris, enlargement of labia, especially labia majora, and you get uh, changes in external genitalia that would give you an idea of masculinization, including the closing of the valve or cleft you get development of median raffe, which is fibrosis that, uh, that closes the cleft. So when this baby is born, it will look masculine because where there should be a hole, there is a, there, there is a membrane or a thick part of skin, which is a median raffe, just like in the scrotum. Then you also find the late yeah, major, major look much like scrotum, 
labia minora are also large and they, they are continuous with a large clitoris that looks like a small penis. And you know, clitoris is much like penis, including even a hoop. It has a clitoral hoop, which is like the prepuce of the penis. And of course, you remember the blood supply, drainage, and nerve supply of uh, clitoris is exactly like that of, of penis. The only difference between clitoris and penis is that urethra never passes through the length of the clitoris, whereas urethra is supposed to pass through the length of the penis. Unfortunately, for people who have this ambiguous genitalia abnormality, they also have a weakness of the Y expression. So the urethra fails to pass through the length of the penis because even to pass through that, the ventral aspect of the penis depends on receptors and testosterone and mainly the HY antigen. So you still need the Y expression for the uh, urethra to pass through the penis. And that's why sometimes you find complications like hypospadias, where the urethra opens uh, earlier than the tip of the penis. So the important thing about this, what we are talking about here, is that the synthesis of cortisol and the synthesis of androgens uses the same process in zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. And a lot of the androgens are actually synthesized in zona reticularis. So both zona fasciculata and reticularis and the gonads produce the same steroids. They have the same enzyme systems. But because of the emphasis of which enzyme is more predominant, that is why we find production in these zones is different. Such that, for example, the zone of fasciculata that mainly produces cortisol, and cortisol is mainly produced from 17 alpha progesterone, we find the most important enzyme here is the hydroxylase. Is 21 and 11 hydroxylases, alpha hydroxylase, that hydroxylase 17 alpha progesterone. That is what is mainly the enzymes in the zona fasciculata. And those are, that is why cortisol is produced here and is the main, is the main hormone. When you go to reticularis, there's a lot of uh, 20, 21 decimalis that helps to change 17 alpha progesterone to DHEA or epiandrosterone to androsterones. So that a lot of androsterone production is in zona reticularis or those zona reticularis produces also the other steroids. Then you find that zona retica, zona granulosa, which is the outer zone, is very important in production of aldosterone, the hormone that regulates reabsorption of sodium in the kidneys, ends the hormone that regulates volume change because of the excretion in the kidney. And so zona glomerulosa is really for production of aldosterone. So we find it doesn't really have 17 alpha progesterone, I mean uh, 17 alpha hydroxylase activity. It doesn't have 17 alpha uh, progesterone enzyme activity like zona fasciculata, but it has a lot of activity of 18 dehydrogenase. We'll come to look at the synthesis and you will understand 18 dehydrogenase is the specific enzyme that helps to, to change DOCA or DOCA, that is deoxy, acid. It is helped to be changed to become aldosterone. And this only happens in the cells of zona 
glomerulus at the outer zone because uh, it is where this enzyme is, is where aldosterone is made, and aldosterone is for reabsorption of sodium. Of course, it also gives uh, loss of phos phosphorus and uh, potassium so that it also gives you for phosphoturia. So phosphates, phosphorus, and potassium are lost in exchange of the sodium that is reabsorbed. That is zona glomerulosa. Zona glomerulosa is not under the influence of ACTH, except we said ACTH is tropic to the adrenal cortex, the gland. So it increases hyperplasia, it increases mitosis, it increases nutrition, it increases the growth of the gland. And therefore, although ACTH does not increase the enzyme activity in this zone of glomerulosa, it increases its hyperplasia, its mitosis, and its general well-being. And that is what one would say about ACTH effect there. But generally, we say uh, ACTH does not regulate the physiology of zona glomerulosa. This is regulated directly by renin angiotensin system. So that this zone is directly responsive to levels of angiotensin. And remember, angiotensin is regulated by renin from the kidney and it is itself altered in the lungs and liver through angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. That is an uh, enzyme called angiotensinase, and that is what is in those organs, and that is how vasopressin, this, uh, um, this hormone of the zona glomerulosa is in is aldosterone. So aldosterone is not under the influence of this which is only for the other two zones. So, so much for the structure of uh, the adrenal cortex, but you need to realize that when you look at all the cells of the dissection, the cross-section of adrenal gland, you find that again, 70% is zona fasciculata and reticularis is only 5%. The zona glomerulosa is 10% of the adrenal cortex. When you look at the whole adrenal gland itself, adrenal cortex is 80%, the medulla is 20%. The medulla there in the middle chromaffin cells is only 20% of the weight of the gland. And I told you the gland is 10 grams on each side. So we have a total of 20 grams. Compare with ovaries that are also 10 grams and testes are 20 grams. So you can actually see, and all this produce steroids. So we have talked everything about the morphology of adrenal gland. Let's leave adrenal medulla for a while. You can come back to it later. But it is a gland within a gland. It is a medulla that is within uh, the outer part, which is adrenal cortex. And of course, the blood supply is a lot, like I have told you, from both the renal artery and also directly from aorta. And when, you, when it increases from zona glomerulosa, so that is where new cells are formed from. That is where mitosis um, comes in. And then these cells migrate inwards. Go and differentiate into zona, uh, fascicularis and reticularis. But adrenal medulla being like a neuro organ does not regenerate. 
is that way. It's just like we saw in the pituitary. Posterior pituitary is actually a neuro organ made of nerves, it's neuro. Even adrenal medulla is neuro. It's like a sympathetic pancreon. So wherever there's the, where, um, whereas the adrenal cortex can grow and grows large, adrenal medulla does not grow or regenerate even when it is uh, damaged. Only thing it can also have uh, hyperplasia just like other cells. You can have an adenoma of adrenal medulla. You can even have carcinoma of adrenal medulla. And we shall see the benign swelling or the adenoma of adrenal Uh, 